All right, so we'll start, and uh, like I mentioned, well, let me begin with my name. My name is Henok Elias. I was here last time when Mark was presenting. I'm the organizational ombudsman here for the University of North Dakota, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be highly related to the services that I provide here, which I mentioned in brief last time I was here, and I'll go a little bit more in depth today. But really, the idea is, how do we clarify our roles with one another, with the people that we're supervising and managing? How do we talk with one another, given that we all have shared interests by being a part of this UMD community? How do we find the best ways to negotiate with each other? And think of today as just the beginning of a conversation. It's not going to be the end all be all. Being that I'm quite a facilitative presenter, I'm going to try to incorporate your thoughts in this as much as possible and just be in control of the process as we're going along. You'll hear me talk for a little bit to give you a brief agenda and then towards the end we'll run a simulation. If, it, if we think that it's um, going really well, we'll see how many different layers of discussion we'll add according to the limited time that we've been given today. So let's begin with this word right here, difference management. The field that I'm in has many different names. You've heard it called before conflict resolution. You may have heard dispute resolution, sometimes even conflict management. I prefer the term difference management because I would say half the battle of any sort of battle against battling or conflict against conflict, dispute against disputes, or having enmity with enmity is the perspective. If you can have a mental paradigm shift with yourself and with other people, you've already taken yourself, you've taken yourself and others halfway to the place where you're <coughs> supposed to be. So in calling something a difference rather than a conflict or dispute, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that as human beings, we all have differences. So the question is, once everyone has acknowledged a very basic fact that I think is the least controversial fact people can talk about is that we have differences, the question becomes, when we notice that we have differences, how do we respond to these differences? These differences may be political, they may be religious, they may be institutional, they may be gender, they may be just uh, speech pattern, the, the way that you like to be approached, you know, um, it could be punctuality. There are so many different topics we can discuss. The very basic thesis, though, of my entire presentation today, and indeed my entire line of work, is that there are human differences, there are ways, multiple ways, to respond to these human differences. Let us all work together to find the best way to collaborate seeing where we have the same interests so that we can have our differences of opinion where we must, but where we meet up as much as possible, connect and collaborate, and have as much peace engendered as we possibly can. So I am very wary of absolutes. I won't say never say never, because that is itself an absolute. But I will say that I'm wary of absolutes. And so a lot of people like to say perspective is everything. Rather than falling into that trap, I will say perspective is almost everything. Um, so take this idea of how you can look at one situation and how someone else can look at that exact same situation, given the same facts, the same evidence, and have a totally different perspective. Keep that in mind and it will allow you to work with others to the best extent that you can. That's, a, I think, a great way to start it off. So a little bit more about the Ombuds Office, or what, what do I mean by this concept that may appear vague at first glance, difference management? To break it down further, there are many channels of difference management here at UND. Most of them are formal channels. HR, EEO, EAP, um, the even the public safety, even disciplinary actions that you may be able to administer. All these are formal 
ways of managing the differences of human beings. The Ombuds Office is the informal place to manage the differences between human beings. It's informal in that a lot of these formal processes, they're part of standard, the standard processes of the university, and you must do them. If, if someone does this, you must do that. So there's not a lot of consent asking on the person. The Ombuds Office operates on the idea of voluntariness and consent. The second idea is uh, in a place like North Dakota where there are sunshine laws, we have the open records laws, meaning a lot of things are subject to being examined by many, many eyes. That changes the nature of the conversation, whether you're talking about um, differences you may have about how to lead, or you're talking about differences that may lead to disciplinary action. It changes the nature of the conversation if you know others are watching. And so the office operates the vast majority of the time paperlessly, even as little email as possible. Identity protection is related to the informality, and that means to the extent allowable and permissible by law, the services that I provide from the Ombuds Office, and right now it is just a, me as a solo practitioner, are confidential. Impartiality means there are staff, students, faculty, um, admin, there are a whole lot of groups within our UND community. I cannot be an advocate of any one community. What I try to do is find the win-win situations for everyone involved so that the greater peace can be achieved to the best extent possible. Independence has two components. The independence of the office means that, and this is related to the confidentiality and all of, the, all of these four eyes in general, not referring to my spectacles, but um, the case management that goes on is going to be only up to the purview of the organizational ombudsman, who is me. So all, others are not going to know the specifics of any particular case. I will be releasing reports periodically that have non-specified data that may point to trends if you start seeing the same issue coming up again and again. But other than that, it's a pretty unhampered or untampered with case management. And then for the purposes of evaluation to see whether or not this is a worthy component of the UND community, if there's value being added for everyone, the provost evaluates uh, the office. So now we're going to test the idea of perception. Everybody, uh, let me go back and have she explain. Everyone's going to look at the screen and just tell me first in your head, first speak to yourself in your head and then I'm going to ask you questions, the first thing that you see. And this is going to highlight how do we could look at the same thing and have different perspectives. So just the first thing, just think in your head, don't say it out loud, the first thing that you see. Okay, now I want you to just talk to whoever is next to you, Jason with Joe, Charles and Jason, Orlin and Molly. Just talk to each other about what's the first thing you saw. What's the first thing you saw? I saw a fish. I saw a fish first. I saw both. Mm -hmm. Because I caught yeah, quick well, so I saw a fish and I saw a face. And then after a while, I was like, what else am I supposed to see? So I looked and I saw a face. Right. Okay, now let's uh, share it in this larger group. I'll take at minimum two, at maximum six answers. Okay, who wants to go first? I saw the face. You saw the face first? Okay. Saw both the face and fish. Simultaneously. Okay. I saw the fish. Fish? Face and fish. Face and fish at the same time? Okay, maybe I held it for too long. I saw fish. <laughs> I, I think saw so. Fish. <laughs> I saw fish first, but I looked beyond right away, and I could see the face. So. Yeah. But the fish is what stood mm -hmm. out to me the most. So I, I've done, we'll look at it again, now that we have uh, time. But I've done this exercise before. I've heard some people say they see the fish first, and then the face. I've heard people say they see the face first, and then the fish. I've heard people say they only see the face, they cannot see the fish. I've heard people say, they only see the fish, they can't see the face. And there was one time where someone told me that they saw a cat. Um, <laughs> now, I won't, I won't say what I saw, but the idea of this exercise is the, to highlight the first point about human differences. No matter which situation professionally we find ourselves in, if we begin 
every conversation with another person with the idea that we can look at the very same thing and come away with a different point of view. It means that even identical twins raised in the same environment can come out having different behaviors. I think it makes us, uh, as leaders, more humble in coming into that conversation. It doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that everyone that we're managing or supervising says to us, but what it does mean is that we're not going to immediately write someone off because they're looking at the situation in a slightly different way. It means we're able to hear what they're saying, not like statues hear things, because statues have ears, but they don't actually hear, but we could hear things in a genuine fashion through what's called active listening. If a lot of you have had training in active listening before, we can listen for specific words or even frames or lenses through which the people we are interacting with are speaking, and we can take that information and try to explain it to them. If nothing else, we can explain our point of view to them in their own words, which will decrease the friction, it will de-escalate the situation, um, and it's kind of a bare minimum form of interaction that will allow them to succeed. Thank you. problem. Um, so wearing different hats, one of the ideas that Chuck wanted me to get across for you all today is what I mentioned in the beginning. One of the differences that people tend to have is what when they wear different hats. Of course I'm not talking about literal hats. You can wear as many literal hats as you want. I'm speaking today about functional hats, about duties, roles, responsibilities, tasks. And so sometimes when we're in the work environment, we have the hat of a manager, the hat of a counselor, the hat of a friend. So that I don't leave these terms lingering, we'll work with these very basic definitions. They're not dictionary definitions, they're just something that I wanted to make short that we could expand upon. And if anyone here wants to expand upon it in any way, I'm open to hearing how they would do that. But let's begin with just going through them. A manager has some sort of distinct professional boundary. It may be written in your job duty explicitly. It may be an unwritten rule that you've spoken about with whoever is over you. A counselor can be a, a professional mentor, you know, someone that is helping you in your specific task. Maybe they're the person who helped you with the onboarding when you came to UND. Maybe there's someone who's been involved with the UND community for a long time and helped you acclimate to the environment when you first came here or after you had been here for a while. That's the professional side of it. The personal side of it is you can have secular or religious advice. Um, you know, the idea that you could seek out uh, different, you know, if, if need be clinical help or religious help at your local uh, religious, whatever your religious faith may be, that is a form in which you could have counseling as well. A friend is a very obvious term, but honestly people use this word in so many different ways that you would think you wouldn't have to define it, but there are some times when someone says friend or buddy or pal and it's a pejorative. It's, it's meant to kind of put you down. But there's sometimes when someone is your friend and it just means acquaintance. There's sometimes when you use the word friend, and this is the definition I'm going to go use it, for extracurricular activities. And what that, what that means is you hang out outside of the work environment. And so with these three working definitions, ideally, ideally, and there's never going to be an explicit prohibition, at least as of yet. I could tell you that in a workplace I worked in before, there were a lot of people the same age, and in fact there were managers who were younger than some of the people they were managing. And so one of the explicit policies of the organization I was in, and people can do this, but it's not the case here, is for example, they had like a dating ban and even uh, an alcohol ban where people were of age, but they weren't allowed to have alcohol together. They could you know, go to the park together, but they couldn't uh, go to a bar together, for example. It's one of the explicit policies of an organization 
that I had worked with before. But for example, we don't have that here. But what we do have is the idea that first we need to acknowledge that these hats exist. Then, after we've acknowledged that, we can ask ourselves if we are fulfilling or mixing any of these roles with any of the people that we're working with professionally. Then once we've done that, we can understand that it is going to be highly discouraged to mix these at least at minimum <laughs> during work hours. Outside of work hours, if there's this, okay, I'm no longer in manager mode, now I'm in counselor mode, or I'm no longer in counselor mode, I'm in friend mode. If we can separate these very distinctly in our minds, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. But there could be many different complications and conflicts of interest that arise, whether it's regarding disciplinary action, even if it's not discipline, even if it's just daily tasks. If you're trying to do daily tasks and someone is looking at you as friend or counselor rather than manager, there are different complications that could arise. They may be too friendly with you. They may call you by a nickname that you may like outside of work, but you don't want people at work to talk about. They, um, they may feel betrayed that you would tell them or advise them to do one thing, but what you say may be for outside of work, and then when you come to work, it may be a different thing going on. So one of the things I would just say is, whenever we have multiple relationships with the same person, we have to be conscious of how those relationships interact with each other, particularly, and this is a calculus that each one of us has to do as individuals, when one of these relationships is monetary, meaning it's our profession, we make money from it. Whereas another one, being a counselor, it could be something, I don't know if you moonlight as counselors, any of you, but it could be something that we make money off of, but more likely than not, it's something we do because it's our way of giving back to people. And then being a friend is, is more, it's more egalitarian, it's more we're on the same page. And so that, that's a type of thing that just keeps you going when you have friends, particularly in a smaller community, you know, it's hard to, to have as many separate relationships because a lot of you are going to have the same interests. The idea of shared interests is what I talked about from the beginning and maybe a lot of your shared interests are why you work here and dining for higher education in the first place. Okay, so there are two theories and this is about how to deal with people in, and I've been trying to highlight or unearth ideas that we don't usually think about. There was a training recently here about microaggression. You may hear this word a lot. There's also though the counter concept of microaffirmation. I put these two kind of researchers here in case you ever wanted to go in depth further. As I said, today's just the beginning of the conversation. But Chester Pierce is a researcher. A lot of his work was from the 70s at Harvard in psychiatry and the idea of a microaggression is to be conscious of who is a marginalized person in your community who is otherized who is viewed as the pariah who is not given kind of the the most respect and whenever you're around that person if you're managing them how can you make sure that the things that you say here's a microaggression even if they seem kind of in passing, don't affect that person. One of the things, for example, may be if you have uh, an international student working with you, them being from a different country is not the sum total of their identity. So, for example, the question, where are you from, sometimes they've answered that question a thousand times. And whether you know it or not, it may be something that, you know, really frazzles them. And if it, it may lead to other differences where they start forming an opinion about you because of this thing that they view as a microaggression, but you might have just thought was a normal question. So we just have to be conscious of who are the least populous members in our community and which words could potentially frustrate or uh, you know, mess with them in ways that, that you had not originally thought of. 
I don't know if at this point anyone has ever thought of what could potentially be a microaggression. I, again, I haven't gone into it in depth, but I just mean um, things that call out or acknowledge that someone is different, that someone's very different. Has anyone seen or heard any situations where you're in a work environment and someone has noticed that someone is, is very different than everyone else? see some nodding heads, but no specifics. Well, it's fine, I don't need specifics. But I just want you to, to think about it, and if it comes to you later, you can, you can mention I it I think as cultural, well. cultural would be one of them. You, you notice it right away. If it's yeah. a cultural difference, you'll see that sometimes. When you say culture, what do you mean? Then maybe dress different. Dress code, yeah. Um, I don't know, what, what, is the, uh, what is the uniform policy? Is, it, is there a uniform uniform policy? No, there is. Yeah. Okay. So the kind of counterpoint to Chester Pierce is Mary Rowe. She's a fellow ombuds colleague, a researcher at MIT, and she come up. She's come up with a philosophy of micro affirmations, and so it's supposed to be the reverse part of the coin. If you see anyone, um, and there's a there's a meme online which I think is the classic representation of what a micro affirmation is. And it's the idea of equality versus justice. So you have here a podium, and you have three different people, one super tall, one medium height, and one short. And the idea is, if you just say the word equality, and you have this podium here, the three people who come up to the podium, the taller person is going to be able to see everything, the medium height person is going to be able to see most things. The short person might not see anything at all. And so the question is, in our work, are we going for streamlining equality more? Or are we trying to do something for the sake of justice? So justice would be bringing in some sort of stand so that the shorter person could see over the podium and see everything. Well, how does that relate to a micro-affirmation? It's the reverse of the microaggression. It's looking for someone who is a marginalized member who's seen as the pariah or the other in your given community and going out of your way to say something cheerful to them, to try to commend them for work that they're doing, to try to not make them feel as different but to feel that you found a way to make them a part of the community as much as possible. Whichever way that will be, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution, so I'm not going to give you a one size fits all solution. But again, if regarding this point, you have any ideas or if you're already implementing this in your work lives, if you know of any way in which you can reach out to someone who you know is feeling different and try to make them feel the same as much as possible. Again, it doesn't mean that we have to all hold hands and proverbially sing Kumbaya, but it does mean that you can find different ways of acknowledging and recognizing someone's work, not, not just to have a streamlined, um, oh, I didn't say it to this person, so they're going to be mad if I say it to this person, but in the idea that if I don't say it to this person, they may feel even more left out than if I didn't say it to this person. And so trying to see what, we, what can we do on a micro, on a small level, because these things add up over time. The analogy they gave during the microaggression training was that if people say a lot of small negative things that may seem like nothing, you know, if you get a paper cut, it's not bad. But if you get a thousand paper cuts, you're in trouble. And what I would say is if you turn that the reverse way, I don't know if you have a favorite juice or if you have a favorite food or whatever, whatever is something that you like, whatever you find to be savory, but I want you to imagine that if you had one of those, you might feel just a little bit okay. For me, it's cinnamon rolls. I love cinnamon rolls. But if I had a thousand cinnamon rolls, and whatever your functional cinnamon roll is, I'd be feeling great. <laughs> My body wouldn't love me, but <laughs> I'd be feeling great. And so I want you to think about the, the micro-aggression as the paper cut, the micro-affirmation as a cinnamon roll or whatever it is that, that, that brings you that little piece of joy. And imagine if that joy is multiplied a thousandfold how you can reach out to marginalized people in your workplace. All right, so we're going to go through one kind of point that I'm going to highlight in three ways. 
regarding negotiation, and then we're going to jump into a negotiation exercise. Leave this face down for now. This face down for now. fundamentals of negotiation or what you can call negotiation 101 are are you being an adversary of somebody or are you trying to integrate them in your plan are you being competitive with one another or are you trying to collaborate or the very most basic way that even elementary school kids can understand are you going for win-lose or are you going for win-win I was in a political theory course one time, and to highlight, um, to highlight the difference between a win-lose philosophy and a win-win philosophy, this is what the professor said. And if any of you are monetary experts, I want you to put inflation aside. But this is what he did. He asked each one of us, he said, would you rather that if I had it, I gave the whole class $10,000, or all of you, each one of you, $10,000, or just one of you, $5,000. And the only way you could all get $10,000 is if you all write on a paper, 10000 So everyone had their own paper, and everyone was given a chance. If you write 5000 you have the chance to be the only one to get 5000 If everyone in the class gets 10000 and writes down 10,000, then everyone gets 10,000. And surprisingly, to me at least, about a third of the class wrote down 5,000. And what, what the point highlights is if everyone has something, then you feel that what you have is cheapened because you compare yourself to a lot of people a lot of times. So it's not necessarily the substance or content because obviously 10,000 is double 5,000. That's kind of an extreme example. You know, it's taken to one end of the spectrum. But if you had 5,000 where everyone else didn't have anything, some people feel better when someone else is down. Now that's a trait of what's called narcissism. Um, and so what I'll, what I'll say is, if someone is the type of person where they only feel good when others are put down, management is probably not for them. Because management is a, is a team effort. And so, what we have to realize is that the first assumption is that we do want to integrate others. We do want to collaborate with others. If possible, we do want a win-win situation. And so, as much as possible, when we negotiate with other people, when we're trying to bargain, wherever it may be, at the very least, even if we're not going to go with the opinion of someone else, we should consider it and see how to incorporate it as much as possible. Otherwise, <laughs> we're just dominating everyone. And to see what that's like, now I want everyone to turn over their papers, and we're going to do a quick exercise. Um, can you just raise your hand if you have person one? OK. Raise your hand if you have person two. OK, so if you're a person two, go with a find a person one. If you're a person one, find a person two. But don't show the other person. Don't show the other person. Keep your paper to yourself. One. One. Joe, are you one? Two. I'll go. I'll go with you. Okay. Is everyone, are you, are you a one and a two? Are you the same or are you different? Okay. 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 So get with your partner and take a moment to read it by yourself. Don't show your partner what's going on. There are general facts of this situation. And there are specific facts of this situation. This is a classic negotiation example used by a lot of sophisticated negotiators. So I'll speak the general facts, and the specific facts are on your paper. The general facts, and you can call me the person, the salesperson if you want, but the general fact is that everyone here is trying to get to a specific farmer's market, and at that farmer's market, 
there's a specific stand where they sell organic oranges. And everyone here wants these organic oranges. I'm not going to get more specific than that because, you're, um, because you have the specificity on your paper. But what I will say is there's a person one and a person two, and I could have given them names. I'm trying to make them as gender neutral as possible. Uh, but there's a person one and a person two, and you're going to have to negotiate with each other to see what you want and how are you going to get what you want. Try to incorporate the very brief principles of integrative bargaining, collaboration, and being win-win as possible. But ultimately, you're going to decide if that's even within the realm of possibility. After that, we'll gather together and we'll have the chance to see first how we analyze this situation and if there are any principles we can draw on it in our work lives. And this is going to be uh, kind of the more incorporative side. And, and you can see how I could have spoken the whole time, but this is the your time to shine. Do a little theater. So um, we'll give you, is everyone ready? Does everyone have their role pretty ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're if you're ready and you know your person we pretty well. The same university. Um, no, so uh, I will specify that a little more. There is one person who works at the Make a Wish Foundation and one person who works at the university. I won't get more specific than that. You'll have to get that out of the other person, and they'll share with you only what they want to share. They don't have to share everything with you. So it's up to them. I'll I'll give everyone. Five minutes. If you finish sooner than that, then we'll then we'll go sooner than that. Go ahead. And I'll, I'll be wandering around to listen to your conversation. Begin your negotiations. <laughs> Which person were you? Person I'm one or two? Person and one. Well, tell us a little bit about person, what your goals were. Um, I guess I just you know if we could both get up and a little bit then. Well, I only have 10 pissed off people, and I may not get fired, so... Okay, so could, could you tell us, so you were which character? First one. And what, what was your goal? <laughs> you try trying to get fired from what? Um, apparently I've had two write-ups in the past two weeks, so I cannot afford another one, assuming that that would get me fired, I guess. That's kind of an assumption there. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so are these all the same? Like, are they all different? That there are... Uh, I was trying to get these dying patients their oranges. Okay. That sounds... Uh, Good. <laughs> so what happened? We ended up negotiating. Hopefully. Split them, yeah. So you, you split, you had 10 each? Yeah. Okay. So I heard Jason saying something about <laughs> splitting the oranges in half and then giving each half. So so, so what's going to happen then? Is is your manager going to like that? And are 10 of the patients going to like that? Or are you going to cut them in half for them? Or mm -hmm. what are you thinking? I. I don't know one way or the other whether they'll be satisfied or not, whether they'll appreciate it or not, but okay. Yeah, I mean, get what you get. I mean, there's only so many oranges at the market. I mean, okay. So we've been given the same situation, right. just like the the picture that we saw earlier, and we'll see how different people can look at the same situation and act differently. So, Joe and Molly, what's what going on? Initially, I wanted, the, of course, the twenty oranges for my dining patients. Okay, so you were with the Make a Wish Foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, you know, towards the end of our negotiation, we, th we thought about having more just brought in from a different farm, different farm, different market. Different market. Okay. So we can both be. And was it was it available? Uh, was there was there any time sensitivity to the issue? Well, I'm sure there was time sensitivity, but if we were at a farmer's market, there's going to be more than just one stand so <laughs> for organic oranges. So. so what was the end up, uh, what was the final deal that you all came we up with? We agreed that we would check to see if another stand had organic oranges, 20 oranges. If both stands had each 20 oranges, we would walk away with 20. Okay. If, if not, we would negotiate the charge. We would split them in half. Then. So you would have done, okay, so given certain thought experiments, you know, rarely do, uh, do 20 patients just want specific organic oranges from, right. so I'm, it's, it's an example of being very specific on purpose. The idea is that there is a limit, there are only 20, so there are no extra oranges. So given that situation, 
you would have done the same as Jason and Matt, of just split them in half, and that would have been okay with you all. What would you have said to uh, you know, 10 of the patients, or what would you have said to your manager? Um, this, was all was. this was all there was, we get what we get. I guess I don't know, I practice what I preach to my kids. You get what you get, you don't throw a fit, I mean. Okay, all right, and we'll move on now. Thank you for our last group, what happened? We uh, managed to find a way to both of us get our 20 openings. How did you do that? So it was part of the, we started off with the same philosophy that we're going to split oranges, we cut them in half, we'll do what we need to do. But as more and more talk happens, I needed the inside of the orange. Okay. He needed the peels. What were you Our solution that? was that we would peel the oranges, I would take the oranges back, and he would take the peels. Phenomenal. So uh, there was a way for everyone to win. The only way, though, that you'll ever know if there's a win-win situation rather than a win-lose situation is if you're able to unearth the interests of the other side. To unearth the interests of the other side, one, you're going to have to be willing to listen and listen actively. Two, the other person is going to have to be willing to speak. Now, you're given just a paragraph of data, not a very extensive amount of data, but from the limited data that they were given, they were able to listen to the other side and say, oh, it doesn't have to be cut in half. Particularly when you work with people, you don't want the <laughs> to, to have deals where you're always cutting it in half, because always cutting it down the middle is something we lean towards, but in a way you could say they cut it down the middle, but they found a way for that cut not to go against them. They found it for to be in the favor of anyone. So the idea is you don't want to compromise on your principles, but you have to be okay compromising on your positions. Now principles and positions are different. What do I mean by that? Is from the beginning it seems like each of the three groups had the principle that I really want or need, depending on which word we want to use, my group of people to have these specific organic oranges. And the other side had, if not an equally or better, you know, depending on your perspective, uh, reason for the same want or need for the same specific oranges. So you both want the same things. There are a limited amount of things. We live in a finite world, limited world, and sometimes we want the same thing. But what we want from that thing could be different. In this case, it was very obvious uh, that uh, one side just wants peels, one side wants the inside. So they didn't have to, they didn't have to compromise their original principle of getting everything they wanted. All they had to compromise was their position. Their ori original position was, let me take all the oranges. And the principle behind it was, I need the inside or I need the peels. They changed their position and say, I don't need to take all the oranges, I could share them. But their, so their principles stayed the same, but their position shifted. So one of the important things about negotiation is acknowledging that by virtue of being here at UND, you are going to have a ton of shared interests, a ton of the same principles with anyone working in your environment. Particularly the closer you work with someone, the more, uh, the more interests that are shared you can unearth. So the question becomes, which positions or stances that you hold are getting in the way of your shared principles? How can you get rid of the current positions that you have to find uh, the positions that will fulfill that principle as much as possible? And it's not going to happen any other way than willing speakers and willing active listeners. So um, at this point, I'll leave room if anyone has any final thoughts of how they could relate this situation to any positions or principles that they've had in their work environment. If not, I'm done. But I always, I always want to give room for people to have the last word. So you say with something like this, it would, it's almost to disclose everything. Because like talking with Joe, I was like very like, 
uh, limited on what I was disclosing to him. Yes. Why? I don't know. Because I didn't know his stance. Because you wanted to get all 20 oranges. Right. That was my perspective, too. So. You, you didn't you want to share information because you wanted to get all 20? you got to be firm See but fair. Say that again? you got to be firm but fair. Could you uh, flesh that out for us a little bit? Yeah. You want something, but you have to be, I mean, your your main objective was going in, going in there and getting those oranges. Yes. But on the same token, you had to be fair to the other side of the, the coin. To, to where you were actually yeah, acknowledging their needs also. Yeah, and to consider their perspective, as Jason is saying, or as Joe is saying, to, to be fair to them as much as possible, they have to, as you said, be willing to share and open up and be vulnerable. Sometimes people view it as a sign of weakness or vulnerability. And that's, I mean, it's a classic example of what I said, the win-lose or being competitive I want to win the situation, I want to win the 20 oranges, rather than I want these 20 oranges, but if there's a part of it that I don't need, or, you know, oranges here, again, not literal, functional, whatever they may be in our specific work environments, whatever it is that we're trying to achieve, it does not have to be at the expense of someone else. There can be a way to incorporate them. So you're right, there, there is this kind of unknown hesitance to, to opening up. And I'm not telling you to tell your life story to everyone that you come across. But what I think is an important takeaway or instruction from this exercise is that there are at least some details that we have to be willing to share in order to get the other person to share as well so that we can see where what we shared and what they shared interact and meet and where they could there could be some collaboration especially you know I'm not telling you to do this with any person that you come across anywhere in the world I mean specifically here at UND in your work environment when you're talking with the people above you below you and horizontal to you use these skills and so I, I hope I've answered mm -hmm. in some adequate way is there any other scenario anyone else would like to add or any other Final thoughts for anyone else? Maybe something on fact finding and the power negotiation, just being willing to be open on both ends to find out. I mean, it's, it's even when you have disciplinary action, what's the first thing you should do? Is look at what? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, in regards to disciplinary action, I think the first thing we have to distinguish is informal disciplinary action and formal disciplinary action. I don't know if any of you do this, but sometimes when you work with people, the, the more you work with them, you move from what's called a low context relationship to what's called a high context relationship. A low context relationship is you have to email them and, and write everything, otherwise they're not going to understand what you think. A high context relationship means that you know each other so well, you don't have to write them an email, you don't even have to say anything to them. You could give them a look and they know that there's something going on. So an informal way of discipline is, you know, sometimes just a certain look. Now to some folks that could be a microaggression, you know, that could be that thing if they perceive it in a different way. But if you have a high context where you get to know each other a lot of the time, and they know they're doing something they're not supposed to. Like, um, I don't know, for example, if there is a certain part of their uniform that they're not wearing, a hairnet, or if they're, uh, if they're on their phone while they're cooking, or you know, if there's something that they know they're not supposed to do, and you happen to walk by, and you don't have to go over there, you don't have to go home and email them and have a formal write-up, or you don't have to come right next to them and say, hey, did you know, and tell them in a loud voice. But if you just look at them and they know what's wrong, I think that's an example of distinguishing between the informal ways of disciplining and formal. Now, if it gets to be repetitive, sometimes sociologists and criminologists say, you need swift, certain, and severe judgment against people. Swift because if they think it's going to take a long time, 
they might not care, they might not take it seriously. Severe because if it's, if it's not going to be to one end of the spectrum that is intense, they're going to think that they can get away with it. You see this sometimes with polluters who uh, either on the freeway for individuals or, or large corporations who do a lot of polluting and they'll pay with a fine. You know, they're like, oh, okay, fine, it's fine. Or if someone says, oh, I could be, you know, I could be this tardy on this day and I'll, I have, you know, I have reprimands. I could, um, I could use this many sick days and instead of annual leave days because they're not going to know the difference of whether or not I'm sick. You know, whatever ways that this comes up that could lead to the question that Chuck raised, we have to first identify how, how can we get to them informally before we get to the formal stage as much as possible. And I'll always offer, you know, und.edu slash ombuds, I always offer, the ombuds office is not just for quote-unquote people who need a conflict managed or their difference managed. It could be a space if you want to come and just think out a scenario with me. Part of what I do is just walking through scenarios with people and just plain old information gathering regarding some of the um, areas of difference management that are more formal if you had any questions about that. So feel free to use that as a resource, and that will be all for today. Thank you for your time. I do have one thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, and it goes back to this. I think the big point was that we've learned is that we all made the assumption that we all needed to have the full orange. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we were talking, and he said that he only needed the peel, the solution was plain as day. Yes. At that point, so um, you know, to go into these kind of conflicts, negotiations with assumptions can really lead to trouble. And that's part of what breaks down and doesn't allow you to get work through some of these situations. That's right. There is a classic American adage that I can't say because it's being recorded, but when you assume, yes. you don't have it. <laughs> and I, I think it's very prescriptive, and I'm, I'm glad that you caught that. Thank you. Orlin, how did you know what to disclose? Oh, we started talking about them. Jason came up with the idea that we're uh, splitting the oranges in half. And it's like, well, but I don't need to split the oranges. All I need is the peel. Okay. So that's really what started it. Right. And Jason saying he wanted to cut the oranges in half. It's, I would be willing to give half an orange to each of my people. Yeah. So okay. they all got an orange. And then it's like, well, you know, just, I don't need the fruit. I just need the peel. <laughs> so. So you didn't want to compromise yeah. on getting half the peels well, you know, because you saw a way in which you can get because all Because he them. understood it when I said that I would be willing to split those oranges to give it to each of them, that I needed the fruit. So, yeah. so I mean, it's just a matter of knowing what I really needed. What I, what I had to have in order to be successful was the peel. So, and then disclosing that. Uh, and then that solution was just, we were done, you know. We knew what we needed, so. This was also an exercise, I thought, in critical thinking. It really was. It was double. It was a double exercise, which I love because of that. I think that was great. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think I mentioned to you this the other day, but the faculty of critical thinking, of seeing beyond the surface level, yeah. that is the very nature of the difference management that I do because if it's the obvious answer, people would have gotten there already. You have to just peel back as much as you can in order to know. Uh, now, as Molly mentioned, that that could be viewed as a sign of weakness or vulnerability, but uh, for Orlin to have that, you know, what others could call a sign of weakness, for him, it got him his goal, and it got him his goal more than everyone else. So it may be paradoxical to us, but sometimes in weakness we may gain strength. Sometimes by appearing vulnerable, we can get what it is that, that we want. Can you imagine if he said, I don't want to be vulnerable, I don't, I don't want Jason to ever know that I want the peels, because then he might have an ulterior peel motive. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm just never going to tell him, you know, and then he could posture and look strong and, you know, he could say, I'm never going to do that, then he would have gotten half of what he wanted. So, we have to... Part of the critical thinking that you mentioned, Chuck, is just it's getting rid of or letting go of 
the assumptions or presumptions of what is considered strength, what is considered weakness, and focusing on what is the principle that I want. Not, not what do others think about that principle, but what is it that I'm trying to accomplish? What's the function of my job? And how can I do that best while incorporating others who have jobs that may be highly related to what it is that I'm doing? And that's, I think, the, the largest takeaway, at least, that I would impart you with.